Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'll introduce myself. My name is Sharona Benheim. I'm a neurosurgeon, a functional neurosurgeon at uh, UC San Diego. I'm also up here at Tri-City Hospital. And um, I, uh, I'll give, tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I'm originally from Southern California. I um, was a medical student, actually, here at UC San Diego uh, before I left to do a year-long um, research fellowship um, at Harvard, uh, actually looking at the neurophysiology of the basal ganglia. Um, from there, I went to uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City to do a seven-year residency in neurosurgery. And I then uh, did a fellowship at Yale University in epilepsy surgery and also in deep brain stimulation surgery. And then I spent some time after that at Oxford University, um, specifically um, look, looking at different ways that people are doing deep brain stimulation surgery around the world. So um, I am delighted to be back in the San Diego area, come full circle. And, um, and today I'm going to share with you some of the advances that we have now in deep brain stimulation surgery, how this surgery has evolved over time, and then just talk you through some of the basics of what is DBS, why we do it, who's a good candidate, um, and sort of what to expect. So let's get started. So what is deep brain stimulation? Well, it is um, a surgery that we do where we implant an electrode that kind of looks like this. It's, if you can't see it, it's actually 1.2 millimeters in diameter, so kind of like the size of a spaghetti, if you can imagine that. Um, that electrode is implanted into the brain, either on one side or both sides of the brain, depending on what we're treating. And it is connected through an extension wire that's all under the skin to what is essentially a pacemaker. It's not a pacemaker for the heart, like a standard pacemaker. It's a pacemaker for the brain. We call it an implantable pulse generator. And we place that pulse generator underneath the clavicle, kind of where a pacemaker would be placed. I like this picture, which you can kind of make out, hopefully, of the relative sizes of, of the electrode, which is this little thin strip that you can barely see compared to someone's hand, um, and, and the bigger piece here, which is actually the pulse generator. So let's go through for who's a candidate for deep brain stimulation. So not everybody is a candidate. Really, only uh, certain people become candidates for this procedure. So who is a good candidate for this procedure? Well, someone, and probably most importantly, who has a diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. We want them to have that diagnosis for at least four years. And one of, that, one of the reasons for that, why we like to wait at least four years after a diagnosis, is because we want to make sure that we're not dealing with something else. There's all sorts of things that really look like Parkinson's disease, especially in the early stages of the process, but turn out to eventually be something else. For example, all of the Parkinson's plus syndromes that you might have heard about. So what we really, uh, but we know DBS works for idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and it doesn't work as well for those other, um, other uh, disorders. And so we want someone with idiopathic Parkinson's disease and also who has the motor complications of Parkinson's disease, specifically tremor, um, rigidity, the difficulty with moving, and bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement. Um, Patients who are good candidates for deep brain stimulation surgery have a great response to medication, specifically the levodopa analogs. Um, and in fact, when we do our screening process for who is a good candidate for the surgery, in fact, we want to see patients off medications and do a very objective scoring of their movements. And then we want to see them on medications. And we want to see that they're at least 30% better on medications and off medications. Part of the reason for this is because we see that deep brain stimulation is effective in the same ways that levodopa is often effective. It often does the same things for patients, only in a much uh, more consistent um, manner. Another important criteria, we this deep brain stimulation is really for the motor complications of Parkinson's disease. Where we place the stimulator currently in the basal ganglia is to treat motor symptoms, like we talked about the tremor, 
bradykinesia and rigidity. And so Parkinson's, as we all know, has many, many different facets to it, many different aspects, some motor and some non-motor. But this therapy is specifically geared towards those motor symptoms. And so what we see is patients who are great candidates for this are those that had a good response to the medication, and now maybe that medication is wearing off. Perhaps it's not as effective now as it was when, um, when it was first started, and perhaps now Dosage, dosages are higher or the medication starts wearing off very quickly and we have what we call on-off fluctuations. So the medication starts wearing off, you're in a down state, then you take another pill and now you're on and then you're off again, on and off again. And so this cyclical pattern continues. Deep brain stimulation can be thought of as essentially an additional medication, only it's an electric medication. It's a different way of modulating those neural circuits so that we can provide a very steady state um, of uh, stimulation uh, to achieve, the, to, to prevent those effects. The other thing that deep brain stimulation is very good at dealing with is dyskinesias, which may be a side effect of too much levodopa. Dyskinesias are those extra movements, those extra jittery movements that you might get from an excess of levodopa, which can be seen also in the on state. Another really important point uh, for deep, who is a good candidate for deep brain stimulation. Our patients um, undergo a very um, thorough neuropsychological testing because a good candidate for DBS is a person who has little or no cognitive dysfunction. So, um, and the reason for that is because we know that if patients are in the very late stage of the disease or if a patient has dementia, either from Parkinson's or for another reason, then deep brain stimulation may actually make that worse, and that, therefore we don't want to implant those patients. But we also know that if there isn't any cognitive impairment, then patients do not do worse. In fact, they can sometimes even do better. Um, and so those are the patients that we consider good candidates for this procedure. And then, of course, um, last but not least, we want a patient who's healthy to undergo surgery. This is ultimately a surgery to improve quality of life. Okay? It's not a cure for Parkinson's. It's a surgery that improves quality of life and helps um, our patients to move better. And so we want to make sure that the surgery itself isn't too taxing for, uh, for a patient and that they're healthy enough to undergo it before we would consider them a good candidate. And so ultimately, the decision's not made by one person. It's actually made by a multidisciplinary committee. All of this information is presented, and we sit around in a room, um, and we present several patients usually either on a weekly or monthly basis and we talk about all these different components and every patient um, so that every patient receives individualized care because everyone is a little bit different and then we think about all the risks and all the benefits and decide is this patient a good candidate for deep brain stimulation. I'll talk a little bit about the history of deep brain stimulation. So the technology itself has been around actually since the 1970s. We've been implanting stimulators into the brain, but for various other things. It really wasn't until the early 1990s in France, actually, that it was discovered to be effective for movement disorders. And uh, in 2002, it was approved in the United States by the FDA formally for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And now, in 2018, over 140,000 patients worldwide have benefited from this therapy. And I bring this up because there are some notions still around, you know, maybe people who were thinking about this from 30 years ago, that there's this, an experimental therapy or something that's not been validated. Um, but actually, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a therapy that's proven to be extremely effective and, uh, and, and, um, and validated um, throughout countless studies and experiences. So what are we targeting, and why is this surgery so special? Well, the surgery is, is a special surgery because, as you can see so clearly on this slide, um, <laughs> we're targeting a six millimeter nucleus 
called the subthalamic nucleus. There are other targets for deep brain stimulation, uh, the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus, for example, or the globus pallidus pars interna, for example, but the subthalamic nucleus for Parkinson's disease is by far the most common target. Now, it's very small. It's about the size of an almond. It's deep in the brain, and we have to target it in just the right way, with just the right orientation, with submillimeter accuracy through a dime-sized opening at the, at the top of the head. And so that is why this surgery actually requires a lot of skill, a lot of training, and a lot of uh, extra advanced technology to make sure that we get it just right. And I'm going to take you through a little bit about what we do in this surgery to, to make sure. So it starts out with an MRI. Um, and we have special protocols for our MRIs because we want to be able to visualize the subthalamic nucleus, that small almond-shaped nucleus, which is actually very difficult to do on a regular MRI. It's even, it's even difficult to do on a special MRI, but we're getting better at this, and new sequences are now um, able to show us this nucleus a little bit better. However, um, people who are trained in this procedure are, are fairly comfortable identifying it, and you can see uh, you, can, you can't see it there. <laughs> so, um, so that's step one. The other thing we do that's different in this procedure from other procedures, for example, a, a standard tumor resection or other neurosurgical procedures that we do pretty commonly, um, is that we have to make sure we have um, um, a system in place for stereotaxy, which is a special way we use three-dimensional coordinates to get to a very, very precise target in the brain. And the way we used to do stereotaxy, and still do sometimes, is using a head frame, which looks like this. And it looks like it was invented in the 1950s, and it was invented in the 1950s. It hasn't changed a whole lot, actually, since then, but it is very good and very accurate. However, we now have new technology that allows us to, instead of using this kind of clunky and not particularly comfortable frame, um, we now have this new technology that we call frameless. It's kind of like a mini frame that um, the way we perform this is actually by implanting small fiducial markers uh, in the head and getting a special CAT scan um, and then actually sending that information to a special company who just prints these frames for us for the purpose of deep brain stimulation surgery and they actually 3D print a custom frame for that patient, for that surgery, for that target, and then they mail it to us to the operating room and uh, it's, we sterilize it and are able to use it on the day of surgery. And so using these frameless techniques, we actually maintain our pr very precise accuracy and we are able to make the surgery more comfortable for our patients. Yeah, absolutely. So not every company can do this. This is no, not, yes. So um, uh, um, only actually this, this particular system is FDA approved for this use. So they had to prove their quality to the government even before to, uh, that they, they um, prove it to us. But um, they go through very rigorous, I've actually been to their manufacturing plant, um, which is located in Maine. Um, they actually go through very rigorous quality assurance testing to make sure that everything is um, compatible for use in an operating room. Yeah. So the other thing we do besides using this uh, method of stereotaxy is uh, we often do this surgery with a patient awake. And so why are patients awake during the surgery? Well, um, it's not so they can play the guitar for us as this patient is doing uh, in, during this surgery. It's actually for two reasons. One, it's to do um, another special um, method of localization um, called microelectrode recordings, where prior to actually inserting a deep brain stimulator, we insert um, what's called a microelectrode, which is a specialized electrode that allows us to listen to how the cells in the brain are firing. And we know, and it takes a little bit of, or a lot of training to, uh, to understand this, but we can tell based on the way these signals sound and appear uh, where our target is with a great, great uh, level of accuracy. 
and I'll show you that in just a second. The other reason we actually keep patients awake for surgery is because we want to test for both effects of the stimulation and also for any potential side effects. And we want to do that right then and there in the operating room such that if we're having side effects that we don't want, we can reposition the electrode. So these are microelectrode recordings. The microelectrode is actually much smaller than the deep brain stimulation electrode. In fact, it's only 20 microns um, at its tip, so extremely small. And these are the type of readings that we get. You can see these little spikes, which actually correlate with the um, cells, a single cell in the brain firing. Um, and so I'm going to play for you what that sounds like. There we go. If you hear that little crackling sound, that's actually one single cell in the brain firing. We'll play that again. And it's actually firing at a low frequency with low density. So this is actually not in our target. That's in the thalamus. That's on our way to the target. And this is what the target sounds like. Here are all those little tiny crackling sounds. So that is, those are several cells firing. We, we say that this sound sounds kind of like raindrops on a tin roof. Can you hear that? Turns out they're not. Um, we, with microelectrodes, can actually hear the cells, um, and we can hear a cell if, it, if that one cell dies, and that's actually pretty rare. Um, so to actually move aside, and we can listen to them without damaging them. Yeah, yeah. good. It's a good thing. So. Um, so with those, and, and don't, don't feel uh, discouraged if you couldn't hear it. it. It takes about 10 years in order to distinguish those sounds. <laughs> so um, these are the kinds of rasters that we get after we do um, our, uh, our microelectrode run. And you can kind of see uh, faintly that uh, our target looks a little bit different than the cells coming before it and the cells coming accurate. And these are 0.1 millimeter spacing. So we actually can tell um, really with a great deal of certainty uh, what part of the brain we're at using this extra technology. However, we do have some um, new technology now available that, that is slowly taking the place of microelectrode recordings. Um, which involves um, having a CT scanner or an MRI machine actually physically in the OR. So we're lucky enough, actually, now to have this at UCSD. Um, I think we're the only ones in the state, in fact, to have an intraoperative MRI scan um, at the moment. Um, but we also have an intraoperative CT scanner. And this picture shows you a deep brain stimulation surgery inside of an intraoperative CT scanner. Getting these extra images gives us that extra degree of certainty that we need um, in order to feel comfortable that our electrode is placed exactly where we want it. And so doing this and using this new technology allows us to have patients be asleep during the surgery. The other new advances in technology, which have just come out in the last year and a half, this is a really exciting time for deep brain stimulation surgery because for really almost two decades, we've had one kind of stimulator. Um, only in the last two years, stimulator technology has advanced. And so now we have um, new ways to interact with the stimulator uh, through Bluetooth. And actually, um, uh, one manufacturer makes this um, compatible with uh, their special Apple, proprietary Apple software. Um, so you can actually control with an iPad a special iPad and a special thing that looks like an iPhone. Um, that uh, technology also has a lead that is uh, directional. So rather than stimulating these electrodes in circles, we can now only stimulate parts of the electrodes, which help us to uh, prevent side effects from stimulation. 
And uh, actually, just several months ago, another company came out with another lead that now has eight contacts in a row, rather than the four contacts that we're used to. So it's really exciting. It's an exciting time, because new things are coming out, technology is getting better, and it's making this procedure safer and more effective. So this is a process. Getting a de I'm glad you brought up that point. Getting a deep brain stimulation um, electrode implanted and, and the generator implanted, it's not like other procedures where you have it implanted and now you get to go home and everything is perfect. Um, it's actually a process. And that this therapy is tailored for every single person and to their anatomy and to their stimulator and to their effects. Um, and so what that requires actually is repeated programming sessions with a specialist with a movement disorder neurologist, who are normally the people who are doing this programming. There's an initial programming session. That's probably the longest one. It takes about an hour. But then you see your movement disorder neurologist, uh, depending on how you're doing, usually every couple of months, just to see how things are going and to see if there need to be adjustments made to the stimulator. And that can be an ongoing process that sometimes you know can, can take up to a year or even um, past that. Sometimes we, need, we, we get more and better effects from our lecture. We're always trying to improve on the way the stimulation is being delivered. Um, now, um, to answer your question specifically, the programming is done by movement disorder neurologists, but the patient actually also has a controller. So they can actually turn their stimulator on and off, and sometimes they can actually, um, based on what their movement disorder neurologist has programmed from them, sometimes they can actually cycle between different settings. So they might have, let's say, three programs to choose from, and they can, um, and their movement disorder neurologist may tell them, go home and, you know, over the course of the next two months, try these different programs and tell me which one works best for you. And so that's, it's an ongoing process that involves both the patient and the neurologist. So, we've talked about all these, all these wonderful things, but what are the risks, right? This is surgery, and surgery always has risks. There's no such thing as surgery without risks. Um, and this is a minimally invasive procedure, but nonetheless, um, the two major categories of risks are the risks just from surgery itself, and there's the risks just from having uh, the stimulator implanted, or a side effect, rather, of the stimulation. So, just very briefly and generally, um, from the surgery itself, probably the risk that we worry about the most is hemorrhage or bleeding. That's the risk we worry about most, and that's partly why we get these very specialized MRIs to make sure that we plan our trajectory very specifically around blood vessels. Um, the risk of bleeding has been reported anywhere between 1 and 3 percent, but the risk of actually having a, 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 a hemorrhage or a bleed that's manifests as something that you can see or tell um, is about 0.6 percent. So, so it's pretty low, but nonetheless it's still a risk. The other thing we worry about is infection, and that's been reported as oh, somewhere anywhere between 3 and 5 percent. We like to keep it, of course, on the lower side. Um, and if there is an infection, just like any other implanted hardware, like a prosthetic hip or a knee or a, a, pa a cardiac pacemaker, if there's an infection, then the system needs to be explanted. Usually we have to wait several months, and then we can consider re-implanting it. So it can make the process a lot longer. And then, of course, there's always the potential for hardware failure, like a broken lead or a disconnection, although now with the newer technologies, that's actually becoming very rare. It was rare to begin with, but it's even more rare. Now, in the, the second category, side effects from stimulation, um, the, the good thing about this category is that this is uh, this is a, a neuromodulation procedure. It's a stimulator that you implant and can control. So if there are side effects from stimulation, you can turn them off. You can also turn them up or down. And so um, um, this is something that we have pretty good control over. Sometimes there are side effects and patients aren't bothered by them because they're just so happy with the effects. Um, but nonetheless, there's a, a long uh, category of potential things that can happen, like difficulty with speech um, or, um, or feeling tingling um, sensations. Um, again, not common, and usually we can program around those effects, um, or side effects rather, just to get our main effect. And our newer technology is helping us do that more and more effectively. You know, I'm sure that that's happened. Um, I implant stimulators for other reasons that aren't deep brain stimulation. I've heard of allergies to other types of stimulators. I haven't specifically heard of an allergy to deep brain stimulation. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay. 
So now I'll show you a quick video. This is a gentleman who's had a deep brain stimulator implanted. He has Parkinson's disease um, that's tremor predominant. So really it's his tremor that's the biggest concern and it's pretty dramatic as you'll see. And here he um, has a stimulator off and then he uses his patient controller to turn it back on. Tremors are getting much worse and oh, almost automatically the power comes back on and I'm steady. So <laughs> that's immediate. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty dramatic. Um, now, not all aspects of, uh, of, of Parkinson's respond as quickly as tremor does. It just so happens that the effect for a tremor is within seconds. The effect for other things like rigidity and bradykinesia is more along the line of, of minutes. Um, but nonetheless, it's pretty dramatic um, and, and can be very immediate. No, no, um, we don't think that that's the case. And we can go over the mechanism perhaps um, at the end. But the ultimate, uh, the ultimate answer to do we really understand the mechanism, we understand we're modulating circuits um, of the basal ganglia and we know where to place the stimulator and what part of the basal ganglia. Um, but how it affects um, dopamine and the rest of the brain um, has not really been clarified. So I'll take a couple of moments now um, at the end of the presentation just to talk to you a little bit about a paper I just published um, that was looking, actually, we, we collected this data about four years ago. So this is uh, really the older technology, an older way of performing this procedure, um, using that head frame that we talked about, not the frameless techniques that we use now. Um, and in this particular cohort of patients, we actually um, shaved their hair prior to the procedure, which we actually don't do now. Um, now we um, are going towards much more minimally invasive procedures, partly based on things like results from surveys like this, where we find out that it does bother some patients, not everybody. Um, and so, uh, um, so we are cosmetically conscious. But in this study, we interviewed about 100 patients who underwent DBS uh, with us, and um, we asked them, uh, you know, a couple of questions about their experiences with the procedure. So we asked them, who mentioned the surgery to you? We found that the vast majority of the patients were um, the first time uh, uh, they heard about DBS was through their neurologist, about 68 percent. But still, there was about 13 percent of patients who learned about it for the first time through a newspaper ad or through a support group or meetings like this, for example. But the vast majority by their neurologist. Now we asked them, after you learned about the procedure, how long did it take before you decided to go forward with the surgery? Um, and so about 38% said right away um, for, um, for a couple of patients or for 40% for of patients, um, it was several months. And, um, and some waited a few years before they decided to, to proceed with the surgery. Um, only seven waited greater than three years. 7%. We asked them if knowledge of that rigid head frame, that contraption, deterred them from undergoing surgery. Actually, the vast majority said no. Um, about 91% said that wasn't too particularly bothersome to them. Um, and uh, we asked about having their head shaved, if that deterred them from proceeding with surgery. And 6% uh, actually said yes, and 94% said no. Of course, the 6%, they were all female, which is understandable. I, it would deter me also from undergoing surgery, which is partly why we've evolved our techniques such that we don't have to shave the head anymore to do this yeah. procedure. <laughs> Uh, so we asked them if meeting with a neurosurgeon helped them make their decision. About 75% said yes. Um, really interestingly, we asked them if meeting with another person who's had deep brain stimulation helped them make their decision. And um, a lot of people didn't have that opportunity to meet with a patient who's already had deep brain stimulation. But for those who did, um, the majority said that meeting really helped them to go forward with the decision. Some of them had already decided in advance that that's what they were going to do. Um, we talked to them a little bit about goals of surgery and whether those were clarified. And that's actually a really important point, clarifying the goals of surgery in advance. What are we actually aiming to achieve with the deep brain stimulation? And then elucidating that this is not a cure for Parkinson's, but this is something we hope to implant to help you move better and improve quality of life.
We asked them to rate their experience with the comfort of the procedure. And we asked them how comfortable was that placement of that head frame for them. And they said it was a five on average, which is not particularly comfortable. These patients are probably being nice. So uh, again, that's one of the reasons we decided to move away from that practice and, and go for things that patients find more comfortable. However, they, uh, we asked them about their overall experience with the procedure, including their experience with being awake during surgery. And the vast majority of patients said that being awake during the surgery was not a problem for them. In fact, 86% said it was not, not a particularly difficult experience and that overall that the procedure was fairly comfortable. Um, and we asked them postoperatively, what are the things that um, now do you find as hindrances to you? Um, Battery replacements is something we haven't talked about. So our, we have now um, the ability to, to implant rechargeable batteries such that they don't have to be replaced for anywhere between 8 and 10 years. Um, but, uh, but then they require recharging, which happens, um, has to happen on a, every couple of days or weekly basis. Um, the vast majority of our patients currently are choosing not to have the rechargeable option because they want the, the generator in and they just don't want to think about it anymore. They want it to just work and they don't have to think about recharging it and they don't have to think about um, how they're using it. But that requires a battery replacement on average about four years uh, down the line depending on what kind of stimulator settings are used. And that's a 30-minute outpatient procedure where we go through the same incision, take out the old battery and replace it with a new battery, but nonetheless it's still undergoing another procedure. So that's a decision that uh, every patient can make. But in this case, actually 13% of patients, only 13% of patients said that battery replacements were a hindrance for them or they felt that that was a problem. Um, Programming adjustments, about 25% of patients said, okay, you know, we're, I'm going to the movement disorder neurologist a lot for these programming adjustments. Um, and uh, discomfort from the implant itself, only 14% of patients said that that was uncomfortable for them. The majority said it wasn't. Um, and then uh, about 20% of patients felt that there was no hindrance uh, after surgery. So we asked them, would you do it again? 78% of patients said yes, 10% said no, 11% weren't sure. We also asked them, would you recommend the procedure to a family or friend? And almost 90% said yes, and 7% said no, 3% said maybe. I don't know who the 10% were that are recommending it to a family or friend but don't want to undergo it themselves again, but those people are out there. <laughs> but nonetheless, overwhelmingly, people uh, looked very favorably upon the process. So, in conclusion, um, deep brain stimulation can be a very effective therapeutic modality really for the appropriately selected patient, and that I can't place enough emphasis on that, the appropriately selected patient. Um, and that patient really should, should be selected by a movement disorder neurologist, and that's something I encourage everybody um, to, to seek out if they don't already have a movement disorder neurologist or have access to a movement disorder neurologist, that's something that's important, even just for a consultation, um, just to see if they're eligible for new or other types of treatments, and DBS and, and others. Um, we're in an exciting time for DBS because advances in technology really are making this procedure safer and more effective and more comfortable for patients. And overall, our experiences are that um, patients really do have a relatively favorable experience undergoing this procedure. We usually don't have uh, a difficulty with getting insurance to pay for this. Luckily, this is approved by Medicare, um, and so um, and so we, we usually don't have an issue with that. Now, everybody has a different insurance plan with different copayments and different uh, percentages, um, so it's a little bit different for every patient. But for the most part, it's not not in um, not not something that obstructs us from moving forward. Usually, not. There's always a possibility um, that. Uh, that the electrode would have to be implanted into a different location, that's actually extremely, extremely rare. But for the most part, what we do, if we don't like the effects of the stimulation, is we try to program the stimulator in a different way. And we have a lot of control over that. In fact, with these programmers, we have something like 500,000 different combinations of being able to program these, all the different contacts. And now with the new technology, that number is even higher. So there's a lot of different ways to program the stimulator that we hope to do in order to get a good effect. 
So now we have good data on this because deep brain stimulation has been around, you know, when FDA approved for 20 years. And um, we do see that, for example, for tremor, sometimes we have to do some increases in programming, like increases in the frequency to maintain our capturing of the tremor very slowly and incrementally over time. But for the most part, a lot of patients actually do well on the same program once it's really been optimized, which again, takes, takes a little while. Sometimes it takes you know, regular intervals, trying to get it better and better, maybe throughout the course of a year. But once it's been optimized, often it doesn't have to be changed. It's implanted in the infraclavicular space, so right under, right in the chest, right under the clavicle. Um, it is, uh, and it's important to remember, everything is underneath the skin. So after undergoing deep brain stimulation from the outside, um, it's real, you, you shouldn't be able to tell that someone has a stimulator implanted. Um, now, in the chest, you do see, of course, an incision. Usually it heals quite nicely in the chest. And you can see, you know, if someone's wearing a bathing suit, for example, you can see a bump, you know, um, in that area, depending on the person and their body type, of course. Um, um, but, uh, but with clothes on, it's certainly not visible. I think the Wellness Center, um, and I want, I want to give credit to the Wellness Center, they do a phenomenal job uh, here of, uh, of galvanizing the community towards exercise and creating these very specialized programs. So um, we, I think that's just really remarkable and wonderful. Um, yes, the answer is yes. So for deep brain stimulation, oftentimes we actually like to incorporate that into our evaluation process, um, doing a physical therapy um, evaluation before stimulation, and then actually also doing a deep brain stimulator on evaluation after, um, after the procedure has been done. So um, I, there is a great benefit, actually, to physical therapy and to exercise after DBS. And a lot of times, actually, we see patients have been deconditioned over the course of time, um, and now they can move a lot better. So they can actually exercise more and have more of that conditioning ability um, and can get stronger. So rigidity actually is one of the things that responds second, second most quickly uh, in the time course of things that respond to deep brain stimulation. Sometimes in the absence of tremor, that's what we use intraoperatively to try to assess um, for effect. Um, it's, not, it's not as obvious as tremor because it's a little bit more subjective um, and based on examination. But um, we have a pretty objective, relatively objective way of measuring um, things like rigidity and tremor um, using standardized rating scales. And so, for example, if a patient's being assessed by a movement disorder neurologist, they're actually going to grade their rigidity based on their examination um, on, a, on a standardized rating scale, which often, like I mentioned earlier, they do on medications and off medications to assess for differences. And so, um, and so seeing that effect is from the medication is actually really predictive of whether the deep brain stimulation is going to uh, have that effect as well. So the on-off evaluation is, uh, is something where basically we ask patients not to take their medications starting from the night before. They come into the office and they have first their off evaluation. Um, then we ask them to take their medications and we wait until the afternoon or, or several, an hour or sometimes more later. Um, and then we do another evaluation. And oftentimes, actually, this is videotaped. Um, so we have a real objective comparison as to um, what's happening before and after medications. And sometimes we actually take these videotapes to our multidisciplinary conference so we can all look at them together and say, you know, how did, how did medications really affect movement here, walking, rigidity, tremor, and so forth. So I think we're going to keep, keep getting better. Um, I think that right now this is a really exciting time because all these new products are coming out and there's much more attention and energy and money actually from industry focused on our our, our procedure and on DBS, which I think is a great thing um, because uh, technology is going to continue to advance. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, that, that batteries, for example, I think they're going to get smaller. And so for people, for, for example, undergoing battery replacements, I think probably in four years when their um, battery life is up, hopefully by then, we're able to implant an even smaller battery um, and, you know, more cosmetically um, um, oriented battery.
So things like that, I think, are, are certainly in the future. Now, replacing DBS completely as a procedure with, you know, something like ultrasound, for example. You might have heard of high-intensity focused ultrasound. It's this new, exciting technology that's out there. Um, that's not quite there now for Parkinson's disease, and I don't know um, where it will be in 10 years. Um, it's something that currently um, is FDA approved for tremor. Um, and we can talk about this maybe um, afterwards, but uh, there are also kind of what ultrasound does, high-intensity focused ultrasound does, is actually create a lesion. Um, and lesions, or, you know, it's basically creating a very, very, very small, very um, um, well-defined stroke in the area of the brain that we want to not be overactive. Um, and so that's actually what we were doing like in the 80s and in the 70s before we had deep brain stimulation. And we found overall that deep brain stimulation, um, even though it requires batteries and, um, and adjustments, is better because we have way more control over what we're doing. We can turn it off, we can turn it on or up or down, and we can really make it so that it works better. So whether or not technology that is still aimed at creating lesions is going to eventually um, um, uh, get more popular, it's not entirely clear because uh, I think ultimately neuromodulation is the future. I'd say they're more in the realm of a movement disorder neurologist purview, um, but basically, you know, that kind of a short answer is we don't really know what starts Parkinson's disease besides that we see that we have loss of dopaminergic neurons in a particular part of the brain called the substantia nigra pars compacta. Um, and so there's been a lot of thought, for example, in let's replace those neurons, right, with things like stem cells or um, other ways of creating uh, dopaminergic you know, adding those dop dopaminergic neurons back into the brain. Unfortunately, um, with stem cell technology, and this is actually kind of an important point, we really are pretty far off. Um, it's something that's uh, kind of being experimented with right now, um, and it's uh, um, and our current ways of, of using these types of therapies actually are, are really pretty nonspecific. They're not really aimed at putting those neurons back where they were lost and having them grow into the areas that they're supposed to target, because we just haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, but perhaps one day we will, and, uh, and we'll have even better therapies. So we often see some genetic um, forms of Parkinson's, which can affect patients much younger. Um, you know, even in their 30s, or some, some reports in their 20s, but that's obviously, that's not the most common um, type it's of Parkinson's. Hereditary. Right, so, so those cases tend to be more on the hereditary spectrum. What we found is that if patients do have cognitive dysfunction, if they have dementia, um, then kind of what I mentioned earlier, which is that implanting a deep brain stimulating electrode, especially in the subthalamic nucleus, can make it worse. So that's why we don't implant patients who have dementia, because we, we want to make sure we're making them better. We don't want to take a risk of making them worse. Um, however, that being said, we have very good evidence that shows that if a patient doesn't have dementia, then um, implanting the stimulator will not make them worse. In fact, can even possibly make them better, but will not make them worse. That's why that's the pool of patients that we implant. Now there's an in-between state called mild cognitive impairment. Those are patients we still consider on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not dementia, but it's mild impairment. And sometimes we choose a different target for them. So instead of implanting the subthalamic nucleus, we'll implant, for example, the globus pallidus, pars interna, sometimes. Um, again, Every patient is a little bit different because, as you can imagine, there's a whole spectrum of things that we have to consider. We found that implanting the stimulator, sometimes patients with dementia just don't, just don't do as well as we want to postoperatively. And we think the subthalamic nucleus is more susceptible, yeah, although some reports say otherwise. So it's, it's really hard to predict that because, as you can imagine, everybody's a little bit different. So it's hard to predict how the symptoms will evolve for every individual patient over time. But usually it's pretty steady rather than just, you know, a, um, a dramatic change in the rate. So Lewy bodies are something, again, we don't have an a exact understanding of, but we can see them in all sorts of Things. We can see them in Parkinson's, we can see them in other types of dementia, called Lewy body dementia, um, but not, not necessarily for everybody. Unfortunately, um, 
experiences with things like MSA haven't haven't really panned out um, as far as uh, being effective. Um, so at the moment, we don't consider them for deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, that being said, will we find new targets, different places in the brain to go for the non-idiopathic Parkinson's disease? Um, hopefully we will, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that as we learn more about these, um, the processes behind the, the pathology, um, we understand more, we'll be able to come up with better and smarter interventions. Um, but right now, we, unfortunately, we don't implant those patients. Well, thanks again to everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>